Hello, I'm Lizzie. Now, it's often said that sound is half the picture. But when it comes to making a film or a video, good audio is all too often overlooked. With good audio, your audience can immerse themselves in your film. They won't even notice the sound. But if it's bad, they certainly will notice. And even if your images and your story are amazing, they're going to be so distracted by the sound that they may well just switch off. So how do you make sure your audio is good? Well, basically, you need to get it right at the beginning. And that means recording good audio on location when you're filming. So I've come down here to the seafront in Aberystwyth to talk to you about how that's done. But what is good audio? Well, at a basic level, it's quite simple. Just try and remember the three C's. Clear, clean and consistent. Clear means that you can clearly hear the sound that you're supposed to be hearing. In this case, that sound is my voice. So you have to make sure that it stands out from the other sounds in the environment and that it's recorded at a good, strong volume. Clean means that there aren't any unwanted or distracting noises and that the quality of the audio is clean and unmuddied. And consistent means that the volume and the quality don't keep changing unless prompted to by the story or the visuals. To record quality audio like this, there are five principles of good practice that I want to introduce you to. They're important wherever you're recording, but down here on the seafront, we've got quite a challenging sound environment. So we're really going to put all of these principles to the test. So what's challenging about this environment? Well, as we're outside and in an exposed location, it's relatively noisy. Noise is unwanted sound and minimising it is the first principle that I want to talk to you about. So when you arrive in a location, the first thing you need to do is assess the environment and think about how you can go about minimising the noises so that you get the best signal possible. Signal being the sound that you want to capture, the sound that you want to pick up. So let's find a new location and try this out. How about this one? Now, my voice doesn't sound as clear as it did just now, does it? And all of these noises are pretty distracting. But bear with me because we're going to make it better. When you assess your environment, you need to use both your ears and your eyes. And if we look around us here, it's pretty obvious what one of the main sound issues is going to be. It's the sea. But if we're going to listen, what else can we hear? Let's close our eyes because that does help a bit. So apart from those waves, I also heard the wind and I heard some seagulls and I also heard some traffic, some cars going by. We don't want to get rid of these sounds because they give us a sense of place, but we also don't want to let them dominate as much as they are doing now. My voice has to stand out and sound as clear as possible. So let's think of ways that we can minimise these noises without having to move to a completely new location. Let's start with one of the worst offenders, the sea. Now, there's nothing much I can do to stop these waves, but there is something I can do, and that's move away from them. I still want the sea in the background in my shot, but let's see if we can't recompose a little bit and find a new position that's gonna work for both our sound and our picture. There, how about this shot? Now I'm standing a bit further up the beach so the noise of the waves is more in the background. I've also turned my body a little bit. The microphone that we're using right now to pick up my voice is actually this little lapel microphone. So by turning my body, I've now got a barrier between the microphone and the noise of the sea. But by turning my body, I've actually made another sound issue that we're having worse. 
the wind is now blowing directly onto me. So let's talk a little bit about the wind. It's actually not that strong today and it doesn't sound like much blowing across my ears. We're also not getting any of the noises that might be created by the wind in the environment, such as the rustling of leaves or the banging of a rope against a flagpole. But I know that what you're hearing is not what I'm hearing, because what you're hearing is what's being picked up by this microphone. And any kind of breeze blowing across a microphone is going to create this horrid disturbance. This is a noise we need to avoid at all costs. But apart from moving somewhere more sheltered, what can we do about it in a place like this? Well, we're going to have to shelter our microphones. And the easiest way to do that is by using something called a windshield. Now, this is a windshield for a shotgun microphone. And I have another windshield in my pocket for this little lapel microphone I'm using here. Here it is. So let's try putting this, this windshield on and see if it makes a difference. Okay, well, that does make the microphone look a lot more obvious, but it's cut out the wind noise, and now my sound is much cleaner. I'd recommend you use proper windshields like this whenever you're recording outdoors. The thin foam shields that come with most microphones, like this one here, simply can't stand up to any kind of wind. And when it's really windy, even these proper windshields aren't going to be enough. In such a situation, you probably shouldn't even try recording. The same goes for any overly noisy environment, such as the machine room in a factory or maybe next to a motorway. You should only record in such environments if the noise is an integral part of your story. But what about quiet environments, such as an office or even a filming studio? Well, there are still lots of noises that could affect the quality of your audio, and you need to assess the environment in the same way as you would an outside location. White noise is a particular problem. Things like the low hum of a fridge or a computer, or the rumble of traffic outside. Our ears are adept at cutting out this kind of continuous low-level noise, but a microphone is not so forgiving. It's much more obvious in a quiet environment and it muddies the quality of your audio without usually adding any sense of place. So you need to do what you can to cut out this kind of low-level hum. Consider turning off the computer or the fridge and look for windows that you can close. When you're inside, it's also important to think about things like reverb, which is the echo of your sound waves bouncing off the walls and other reflective surfaces. Reverb has a marked effect on the tonal quality of your audio, and so unless you're looking for a specific feeling, it's best to avoid it if you can. You'll have noticed how different interior spaces sound very different, so the best way to avoid obvious reverb is to choose the right room. If you can, look for a room that's medium-sized and carpeted, and wherever you are, try to keep away from reflective surfaces like the walls. One problem we don't have to deal with here is reverb. We do have the continuous low-level noise of the sea in the background, but that's expected in this environment. And now that I've moved away from it, um, it's not loud or disturbing, so we really don't have to do much more about it. But what about the traffic? There aren't enough cars to create a low-level continuous rumble, but they are presenting us with another sound challenge and that's occasional noise. Occasional noises like a truck going past or something worse like a siren are really horrible because they ruin the consistency of your audio and that's going to distract your audience. In somewhere like an office you might get the banging of doors or people walking up and down a corridor. If you can, you really need to take action before you start recording to make sure your audio isn't ruined by things like that. So talk to the people around you and tell them what you're doing, or maybe hang a sign asking for quiet. Out here, there's nothing much I can do about that truck going past right now. And there's nothing much I can do about the seagulls either. Both are threatening to disturb my sound recording. And the only thing I can really do about it is to pay close attention. 
The best way to do that is to use a pair of these. And that brings me on to the second principle that I want to talk to you about today. When you're recording audio, it's essential to use a good pair of headphones at all times to monitor what's going on. Using headphones is just as important as using a viewfinder to look at the images that you're filming. Without them, you'd be recording blind. Ideally, you want a pair of closed back headphones like these, because what they do is they cover your ears and they cut out a lot of external noises and that means you can concentrate on what your mics are picking up. And that's all you really need to focus on once you've done a more general assessment of your recording environment using your eyes and your ears. Headphones are a great help when you're trying to monitor things like those seagulls. So what do you do when you've heard seagulls or any other kind of noisy disturbance in your audio? Well, you might have to stop and redo the recording. It's often quite hard to decide whether you should stop or not. It really just depends on what you're recording and how bad the noise was. In general, if you're not happy with your audio and you can do it again, then re-record. Headphones are useful not only when you're recording, but also when you're setting up. They can help you assess your recording environment because there are things you might not necessarily notice without them on. There are also things that you can't hear without your headphones on, such as the sound of the wind blowing across your microphone or faulty equipment. And what about these things? Mobile phones can sometimes interfere with your microphones, creating a horrible noise like this one. Now, you're only gonna hear a noise like that if you actually got your headphones on. To avoid mobile phone interference, the only thing you can do is ask everyone to turn their phones off. And that's something you should do before you start filming or recording. So, headphones are essential for monitoring your audio. But there wouldn't be anything for you to monitor if you didn't have a microphone at the other end. And that's what I want to talk about next, because knowing your mics is our third principle of recording good audio. There are all sorts of different mics for different recording needs, not to mention different budgets. It's important to know a bit about them so that you can choose the right mic for the job and, of course, use it in the right way. Realistically, of course, you're always going to be limited by what's available to you. But even if you've only got the low quality inbuilt mic on your camera to use, knowing a bit about it will help you get the most out of it. And that's important because no matter what mic you're using, you still need to record audio, no matter what you're filming. So let's look at the different microphones that are available to us today. There are four that I want to talk about. The first is the inbuilt microphone on our main camera. Attached to that camera, we've also got a shotgun mic or a directional mic, which has been held up on a boom pole by our Salman Russ. Our second camera also has a directional mic attached to it, and that's sitting right on top of it. And finally, we've got this small lapel microphone, otherwise known as a lavalier, which is clipped onto my coat. Each of these mics produces a different quality of audio recording. That's because some of them are simply made better than others, but it's also because they're designed to be used in different ways, and they pick up sound from different directions. Where a microphone picks up sound and where it doesn't is usually illustrated using a graph called a polar pattern. And I'm going to use some of these today as we talk about our different mics. Let's start with the camera's inbuilt microphone, which is actually the last mic that I would choose to use. If we switch to it now, you can hear why. As you can hear, it's picking up pretty much everything. There's no focus on the sound that we want to capture, which in this case is my voice. That's because it's an omnidirectional mic, which means it picks up sound equally from all around, as the polar pattern we've added shows. 
It's also because it's on the camera, so it's quite far away from the source of our sound. But what if I was to move closer? Let's try it. As you can hear, my voice is beginning to sound clearer compared to all the other noises around me. But now, of course, we've ruined our shot, and I can't shoot with me right next to the camera like this. Let's switch back to the audio we had before. OK, that's much better. Another limitation of this microphone is the fact that it's part of the camera. So that means that it picks up handling noises when you're operating the camera. It's also not very good quality and it produces a kind of tinny, unnatural sound. So this mic is only really good for reference audio or for picking up general background sounds. If you do have to use it, just remember to get up as close as you can to the source of your sound and avoid touching the camera as much as possible. A microphone that does a slightly better job is the VideoMic Pro, which we've got attached to our DSLR camera. So let's go back to our original shot now and switch to the VideoMic Pro so we can hear what it's picking up. That's a cleaner, clearer sound than we were getting with the inbuilt mic. There are a few reasons for that. The VideoMic Pro is a better quality mic in general. It's cradled in a shock mount, which helps isolate it from handling noises quite well. But most importantly, it's got this focused supercardioid polar pattern, which means it picks up sound from the direction it's pointing and rejects it from the sides. I still wouldn't use this mic to record my main audio though. Let's switch back to our main audio now so you can hear the difference. The VideoMic Pro is better quality than the inbuilt mic, but it's still not that good. And like the inbuilt mic, it's limited by its position on top of the camera. We're also being let down by the poor sound recording capabilities of the DSLR camera itself. DSLRs are not designed for video. There's nowhere for you to plug in your headphones so you can't monitor your sound. There are no audio meters on screen so you can't keep an eye on volume levels. There's only a 3.5mm mini jack connector so you can't attach professional XLR microphones. And the wiring inside the camera adds a disturbing hiss to your audio. There are things you can do to overcome some of these issues. But really, when you're shooting with a DSLR, the only way you can get good quality audio is to record onto a separate device. Having said that, if you can't use a separate device, or if you're running around shooting from the hip, then the VideoMic Pro is going to be your best option. What I'm using it for today is reference sound, which will allow me to sync up my DSLR footage with my good quality audio when I'm editing. It's more than adequate for this job. The other mic that I'm using for reference sound is another Rode shotgun with a focused supercardioid polar pattern. Let's bring it into shot now. This is the Rode NTG2. It uses professional XLR connectors, which is what this is. We're using a long XLR cable to connect it to our main camera, and that allows us to mount the microphone on a boom pole. This boom pole gives the mic clear advantages because we're able to position it close to the source of our sound. It's also a better quality mic than the VideoMic Pro. It's more sensitive and it has a greater range. So let's return the mic to its proper position now, out of shot, and switch to the audio that we're getting from it so you can hear what it sounds like. As you can hear, it's both clean and clear. I'd actually be very happy to use this audio. So as well as reference, it's also my backup. So what am I using to record my main audio? Well, I'm actually using this tiny lapel microphone here. So let's switch back to that now. This is the Rode Lavalier. We could have it plugged into our main camera because it does have XLR connectors. But at the moment, we've got it plugged into this audio recorder here using a 3.5 millimeter jack. This gives me greater freedom of movement and reduces cable management nightmares. Like the inbuilt mic on our camera, this lav has an omnidirectional polar pattern, which means it's picking up sound from all around as the diagram shows. It's not picking up any sound from behind me though because my body is acting as a buffer. So it's not directional 
and it's not XLR. Why is it doing better than all the other mics we have with us today? Well, the main reason is because it's so close to my mouth, which is the source of the sound that we want to pick up. Small and discreet and designed to be clipped onto clothing, this mic overcomes the problem of positioning that all the other mics face. Positioning is one of the things I want to talk to you about next, because as you may have already figured out, you not only need to know your mics, you also need to handle them right. And that is the fourth principle of recording good audio. The key to positioning is to get your mic as close up as possible to the source of your sound. That doesn't necessarily mean right up next to the source, it means finding the sweet spot. Let's illustrate with this lapel mic here. Okay, so taking it off makes another thing about handling mics pretty obvious. This kind of direct handling is disastrous for your audio. And it's something you have to be especially careful of with lapel mics. There are ways to hide them inside your clothing or even in your hair, but in general, with this kind of basic lavalier, it has to be attached to the outside of your clothing, and that's to minimise any rubbing noises. We've also got this clip attached to the mic, and that does help because it raises it up and away from clothing, and that minimises handling noises. Once it's attached, you have to be careful that nothing is going to brush up against the mic, like long hair. And the wearer has to be careful not to touch the mic or fiddle with their clothing or thump their chest because that's going to create unwanted handling noises. Where you attach a lapel mic is of course limited by what your subject is wearing. What you want to aim for is about six inches away from your mouth in the middle of the chest. That's where you're going to find the sweet spot. To illustrate, let's move this mic around now so you can hear how different it sounds in different positions. If I was to attach it too far up, what you'd get is a sound shadow because my chin is in the way. And if it was too far down, now it's too far away, too far to the side. Now what's happening now is the sound waves created by my voice have um, dissipated just that little bit more and the background sounds, the background noises are sounding much louder in comparison. So let's just get it back to the sweet spot. And you can hear that's, that's much better, isn't it? What about right up next to the mouth, like this? Now, that sounds, that sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? But you've probably seen performers and people on stage wearing these tiny headset mics right up close to the mouth. Those are special lavaliers designed for that use, and it would look pretty weird in this scenario, especially with a big fluffy windshield attached. As this mic is designed to be attached to clothing, it's also too sensitive to be this close to the mouth. As you can hear, we're picking up a lot of unwanted noises here, like the popping sounds that you get when you say P's and T's. So let's put it back where it should be. Make sure the wire is put away. Okay. So what about our shotgun mics? For them, it's not just position, but also direction that's important because of the shape of their polar patterns. Let's illustrate with our NTG2. Thank you, Russ. Now, I've got this mic in a pistol grip and that's to avoid touching it. Just like with the lav, if I did touch it directly, I'd get unacceptable handling noises. This kind of sensitive mic also benefits from being cradled in a shock mount, which is what this is. This shock mount means that none of the handling noises on the pistol grip itself are transferred to the microphone and also it can be moved around without too much of a problem. Set up like this, I can use this microphone like a reporter's mic. So let's switch to it now. Now the mic is pointing directly at my mouth so we're getting very good sound. But what if I was to move it closer? Okay, now that's going to be too loud. And what if, I, what about if it's further away? My voice very quickly loses prominence. And what if I was to move this mic from side to side? Let's try it. As I move it to the side, 
you can hear my voice very quickly fade into the background. And I'll go the back. Yep, it's picking up the wrong sound there. And his, this is the sweet spot for my voice. And I move it around again, and you can't really hear my voice very clearly. So, obviously, with a directional mic like this one, how you position it is very important. Positioning is also about where you put your microphone in the environment. Of course, this has to be a negotiation between the subject that you're filming and your sound needs. As we've already discussed, we need to minimise noise. So that means you have to position your microphone away from the noise or point it away from the noise. Like this. And if reverb is a concern, you also have to make sure you're not pointing your microphone towards a reflective surface, such as a wall. Another issue to think about is whether it's okay to have your microphones in shot or not. In general, a microphone in shot is distracting, so it's always better to avoid having them there. So let's get rid of our NTG2. Now, what about our lapel mic? Well, in this scenario, it's okay. People are used to seeing lapel mics in factual videos like this. But it wouldn't work if this was a fictional piece, because that would shatter the suspension of disbelief. Keeping your microphones out of shot is the main reason why we usually have our NTG2 mounted on a boom pole. This allows us to position the mic just out of shot, so it's still close, but not in the way. A microphone on a boom pole is usually held just out of shot above the camera frame, pointing downwards. That's better than holding it pointing upwards just out of frame, because the ground acts as a buffer, so it's less noisy. If it was pointing upwards, it's much easier to pick up environmental noises, such as those seagulls. Handling a boom pole is quite a skill. You have to constantly make sure that you're hitting that sweet spot, which means following every movement that your subject makes. You also have to hold it up for long periods of time and make sure it doesn't get into shot like this. Get it up, Russ. There, that's better. Having a sound man like Russ on your shoot is quite a luxury. It's helping us get better sound because he's able to concentrate on it while our cameraman is focusing on the images. Not only is Russ operating our boom pole, he's also monitoring our sound through his headphones. We've already talked about how important it is to monitor your sound as a way of minimising noise. But there's another reason as well. You need to make sure that your levels are right. This is the fifth principle that I want to talk to you about. Getting your levels right means recording your audio at a volume that's neither too low nor too high. You set your levels on your recording device. I'd always recommend you do it manually rather than leaving your device in automatic. In automatic, your device will often limit your sound levels when it's noisy and boost them when it's quiet, so it's not consistent. Of course, sometimes you don't have much choice in the matter and you have to leave your device in automatic, like when you're shooting in a run and gun style with a DSLR. Setting your levels is something you need to do after you've set everything else up and before you start recording. The aim is to get it right at the beginning so you don't have to fiddle with your levels in the middle of things. Of course, you also need to monitor what's going on while you're recording and make sure you respond to any changes in the volume. To show you how to set your levels, I'm going to use a device that I've got right here behind me. And this is the Zoom H2N, it's an audio recorder and we're using it to capture my voice right now. Now to set our levels we're going to need a pair of headphones, these ones, we're going to have to plug them in. And we're also going to have to watch the audio meters that we've got here on the screen. So let's get ready. Put the headphones on. Okay, so all devices that record sound will have meters similar to this one to show you what's happening with your audio levels. As you can see, it's jumping up and down as I talk. 
Our aim is to keep it jumping around the minus 12 decibel level. Some meters won't have these numbers, so what you need to do is aim to have it jumping just right of centre. If it's a coloured meter, you need to keep it in the green, just right of centre, and avoid hitting the red. Let's change the levels now so you can see what happens. Okay, so I'm turning it down now, and it's way too quiet. And that makes it really hard to hear my voice. This is problematic because you're going to have to boost this audio in post-production when you're editing. And when you boost quiet audio, you have to boost all the sounds. So you end up with a lot of noise, like this. Let's turn it up again now. Okay, so it's getting louder, as you can hear. And now I've actually got it too loud. The bars are hitting the top of the meter and these little boxes are turning black as a warning. On a coloured meter, you'd be in the red. And you can hear what's happening to our audio. On the loudest bits, it's distorting. Turn it up some more and everything's distorting. This is basically broken audio. So let's turn it back down again. There's very little you can do to audio that's clipped like this. So you need to avoid doing it at all costs. Okay, so now we've got our levels jumping around the minus 12 decibel mark again. This is what I like to call the Goldilocks zone. Just like in the fairy tale where the right bowl of porridge is neither too hot nor too cold, this is neither too loud nor too quiet. And it's also got enough headroom to accommodate any sudden changes in volume, like when someone laughs. You don't have to worry too much if there are occasional moments when these bars are hitting the top of the meter. You can always fix that kind of minor problem when you're editing. But if there's a more general change in the situation, you do need to adjust your levels. Just don't do it all the time or in the middle of a sentence. Remember, consistency was one of the three C's that I told you about at the beginning. So don't fiddle with your audio levels in the middle of a recording unless you really have to. To avoid the urge to fiddle, what I often do is record my signal onto two channels at two different levels. With one slightly quieter than the other, this means I've got a safety net in case the louder one distorts. Now, not all devices will allow you to do this, so I'm just going to put the zoom away now. And bring on this JVC, because you can do it on this JVC. Now, what you want to do is make sure that your mic is plugged into input one here. And on the other side, that your channel switch is also on input one. What that means is that the signal or the sound from your microphone is going to both channel one and channel two. And if you've got it in manual, as we have here, all you need to do is adjust these dials and watch the meter on your screen to make sure that one channel is slightly lower than the other. Just like that. That's perfect. So those are the five principles of recording good quality audio. Audio that is clear, clean and consistent. Firstly, you need to do what you can to minimise noise, both in the recording environment and from things like handling your mics. To help you do this, you need to make sure you wear a good pair of headphones and you monitor what you're recording at all times. You need to pick the right mic for the job and use it with an awareness of what it can do. And you need to position that mic correctly, getting as close as possible to the source of your sound. And finally, you need to set your levels so that you're recording audio that's neither too loud nor too quiet. That's the Goldilocks zone. And if you can put all five of these principles into practice, you'll be recording audio that's golden too.